This podcast is sponsored by Kadan Kadan. Kadan Kadan is a new groupage app that allows you to share space within a shipping container so that you can save costs when it comes to your logistics and transportation. Visit kadankadank.com to learn more or visit the Instagram page kadankadan official. Good day everyone. This is Malobi Okbechi from the Kadan Kadan podcast and today I have a special guest Musa and he's going to be talking about a value chain that we're not we haven't spoken about that much on this podcast which is the tomato value chain so I'm really looking forward to learning from Musa pick his brain see 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 what we can learn and you know understand some of the challenges and opportunities in his business so um Musa very welcome to the podcast how are you doing today I'm doing great thank you for having me amazing amazing so, uh, Musa, um, what I like to do in this podcast is I like to allow people to kind of introduce themselves. So, can you tell us a little bit about, you know, what's your company's name, what does your company do, um, and any other information that you think will be quite relevant? Okay, uh, my name is Musa Adipashi, uh, CEO of Palmac Syndicate. At Palmac, we process fresh tomato into powder. Um, we this is one of the commodities we've started working on. Our heartbeat as a company generally is to see how we can bring an end to post-harvest losses because we realize almost 50%, 50 to 60% of the fresh commodities that has been produced in Nigeria uh, don't make it to the marketplace. Uh, it it, it, it gets lost to post-harvest um, because there's no off-takers, there's no um, ready market for those uh, fresh commodities. And then... Uh, there's no one to process those fresh commodities. So farmers find it difficult when they farm their farm produce, they find it difficult to find a market, a ready market for those produce. And you know, perishables in generally, like tomato, only lasts five to six days and it goes to waste. So if a farmer farms those kind of perishables and there's no ready market, after, those, after that six days, it automatically becomes a waste. Um, so we are trying to see how we can uh, contribute our quarter to see that we have bring an end to this um, challenge that has been faced by farmers. Amazing, amazing. Um, that's a really good summary, actually. So uh, my, my first question that comes to mind is, what, why did you decide to pick the tomato value chain? I know you mentioned there's a lot of post-harvest losses, but... Is that, is that really the main reason why you chose this crop or were you already kind of in the tomato farming space before you got into this business? Uh, okay, I myself am a farmer. A um, couple of days I've been on the field uh, trying to work with farmers, small older farmers. And uh, one of the, I have been a tomato farmer I like say, since my university. I have worked closely with farmers and then I have seen the challenges involved in tomato is one of the things that uh, tomato is, we lost over seven to 800 metric tons annually to post harvest losses. And what we produce as a nation is around 2.4 million metric tons. And what the nation actually needs is around 3 million metric tons, leaving a huge gap to filling. And while I was reading a report in 20, uh, 2014, I realized that there's huge uh, opportunity in the tomato value chain. And uh, I try as much as possible to do some research and see what can we do differently. We have seen tomato paste all over. Uh, and in China, I believe there are tomato powder, but why is it not in, why don't they import those tomato powder into Nigeria? I had a friend who is there, and then I got samples and I was, we had a discussion. I was, why don't we have tomato powder in Nigeria? Why did these big companies, when they start, they go to tomato paste? Everybody talks about tomato paste. And I was able to realize, okay, the challenges, there's huge uh, challenge when it comes to producing tomato powder, but I, I felt it's something that is doable. And up to today, I think you can only see two tomato companies uh, that are doing tomato powder in Nigeria, uh, Tiger and then Palmark, which um, I founded. So I venture into um, tomato powder because it's one of the easiest way 
we can increase the shelf life of tomato up to uh, like give it a, sh a longer shelf life without the addition of preservatives and additives. Um, that's basically the reason why I chose tomato powder because you can have tomato powder for up to six years. Uh, the, it's shelf life can go to up to six years without the addition of preservatives and additives because I, I personally have a problem with um, additives and preservatives being added to food. So I felt we should be able to do something differently from what uh, conventional um, um, businesses are doing. And then we find we find find out that okay with tomato powder or let's say with processing our our uh, produce products into powder or flex, we can actually work with many farmers. The goal now is to see how we can work with many farmers to bring an end to post harvest losses. Aside from making profits, we we, we we felt there is a way we can actually work with the smallholder farmers and then they earn something out of what we are doing. Because we now working with smallholder farmers, we try to see how we can set up doom solar drying, um, uh, doom solar dryers around the location where they operate. Because that's the only way we can help them. They, we coach them on how to dry this farm produce we take those farm produce from them without them going to trans, like going, um, transporting these fresh, uh, these perishables to a far distance location before they can actually dry this uh, farm produces. So uh, we believe that if we can venture into tomato powder uh, by providing those doom solar dryers to these farmers, uh, we can actually help these farmers, and then we can actually make a business out of. Out of um, uh, as we are helping those these small da farmers. Okay, okay. So um, a, a couple of questions come up there. One is that what are the, the actual uses of this tomato powder? Because some people might, you know, just be familiar with tomato paste. They use it for cooking and stuff like that. So who are your customers? Who do you sell tomato powder for? A lot of people are not really familiar with tomato powder. They might be tomato, uh, familiar with tomato paste, so can you tell us what the tomato powder is used for or who is your customer who buys your tomato powder from you? Okay, tomato powder can be used for soups, can be used for stew, can be used for jollof. And one of the, one of the best ways to, to get your, that freshness alive in tomato is to use tomato powder. Uh, this is the best way you can get your tomato, like feel the freshness of tomato because um, aside the drying process that it undergo without the loss of nutrients, of its nutrients, um, you're just getting, it's just like a fresh, just that a tomato powder, you can um, preserve it for a very long, longer period of time. You can use it in season and out of season. You know how tomato is seasonal in Nigeria, and then we experience scarcity all year round. So um, tomato powder is actually a perfect uh, choice for many people. Um, you can the way you use tomato powder is just you get your bowl. You can use you can make it into paste by using cold or hot water. Um, just you get your bowl, uh, turn the sachets into your your uh, bowl, and then. Get your hot water. Uh, get your. You can use. You can use cold water. You can use your hot water. That's that's the best way you can use this tomato powder. Thank you very much for for that explanation. Okay. And earlier you were kind of getting into the the supply chain aspect. You mentioned that you give um, dryers to the farmers, right? So can you explain how um, the supply chain works, right? You 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 buy the tomato from the farmers. But if you're providing the dryers to the farmers, how do they pay you for the dryer? How does that work? Okay, um, how our business model works. Uh, first of all, um, our business is, is in three phases. Uh, first of all is this extension services we render to farmers. Um, from extension services that we render to farmers, we we coach them on the best agri agronomy practices that they can actually employ on their farms. And we, we set up drying facilities around the location where they farm these um, farm produces. They 
they, we, they, they drive in kg. Okay, each kg we charge you. Some of those facilities are actually owned by the farmers because we can have a group of farmers and then uh, we have a discussion with them. We can, you can, with this amount, you can have your own dryer. You can have your own uh, solar dryer where if you, if you dry this, your fresh commodities, we can actually buy from you. So with that, we, we, we just bargain. What is, what was the price in the market? Uh, how do you want to sell it in the market? If they give us a price, we pay for those um, for, for, for that price. So uh, aside aside that, we have our own facilities where um, we charge them. Okay, if you drive this quantity, this is the amount that we are charging you. So um, after the whole after after they have uh, dried these com uh, these commodities, we actually buy what they have dried completely from them. They may decide to keep uh, till when they want to sell it. But majority of them sell it to us because they felt for us for us to give them extension services for free. Uh, they, they, they believe that they believe we should be able to do business more with them. So they actually sell off those commodities uh, to us. Wow, that, 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 that makes a lot of sense. OK. And from my understanding, because you're in Borno State right now, is that where most of your farmers are in uh, Borno State near Madugri, or where, where do you actually mostly aggregate your farmers? Uh, okay, um, we have we have volume of farmers that cut across uh, the north entirely uh, because our extension services cut across the north entirely. We have farmers in Katsina, we have farmers in Kaduna, we have farmers in Gumbi. Uh, we have farmers in um, Borno State. So all these places are places that they produce tomato in large quantity because before we started processing fresh tomato into powder, one of the things we do is we render extension services to these farmers. And uh, we, try, we try to locate the unions of farmers. Uh, if you have a union and what you do, you, pro, you, you, pro, you farm perishables like onions, pepper, and the tomato, we try, to, we try to see how we can give you extension services and then uh, find um, easy inputs, agri inputs to those farmers. Um, agri inputs in the, in the sense um, like the fertilizer, uh, good hybrid seeds, and then uh, we, we coach you on the best agronomy practices. And uh, we, we do it sometimes, uh, we just do it because for the sake of helping these farmers. That has helped help us a lot because we don't actually charge them. Because right now, if they farm their produces, they first call us, do we need it before they can sell to another, another, uh, other people? So that's how we, we, we operate with these farmers. Uh, as we help them, and then they have, seen the, they have seen the need for what we are giving them, like the coaching, we teach them on the best agronomic practices. They felt okay. They've implemented those practices and they've seen results. So, what can they do in return? Okay, after they farm with this produce, since we use it as raw material, why don't they sell it to us? That's how we um, uh, uh, we operate with these farmers. Okay, and what I've heard from some people is that you know a lot of our farmers because they're older. Um, they're not as open to new information. So how, how have you found um, exposing these farmers to new agronomic practices? Are they kind of, are they open, open-minded to the information or are they kind of, you know, a little bit difficult to convince to, to take these new things on? Uh, okay. I think um, these farmers, uh, basically, we, I, I have been a farmer for a very long time. I've been around these people. And um, I started in, we started Palmark in Kaduna. Uh, I have, I've been in their union. I have seen how they operated. And I have seen the need, their needs. You know, when you're giving a, these farmers information, one of the things they always go uh, look out for is what can they benefit? What are you bringing in for them? Like, why are you giving them? Aside from the information, what else can you give them? So when we go to their chairman, okay, you are the chairman of this union, Tomato Farmer Association, Cardinal State. Okay, this is what we have for your farmers. We are bringing um, 
this company, this company are seed company, and they can give your farmers at a very subsidized price. Okay, they will go to the market and find out that, okay, we're actually giving them at a subsidized price. Okay, fertilizer, uh, something that is very difficult to get, to have access to, we can bring those fertilizer companies to these farmers. Okay, this is the price in the market, but we're giving your farmers at this price. And because it's a union, uh, we are, they, they, we, we, we will go like um, stand as, as guarantors to them. Some of them got fertilizer without paying and then pay at the end of a farming season. And we have been working in that um, aspect and it has been going successfully. So these farmers are always open to welcome us because we are also adding to their own um, yield their inputs and their income, uh, because that's that's what we actually want to do, to see that we have added to their own income at the end of the day. Well said, well said. And and that what I'm getting from this is that, you know, the agri extension services, the sub subsidized fertilizers and inputs, that's actually what helps build a stronger relationship with these farmer unions and it helps them to work closer with you. So that's that's very interesting. Um, another thing I wanted to talk about is, um, I know you're probably aware of Tomato Joss. Um, how familiar are you with them? Have you worked with them? Um, do you collaborate in any ways? And, and, you know, do you think there's any opportunity for you guys to work with each other? Uh, Tomato Joss is, well, I see they are kind of a mentor to us and, um, they have been helping us in so many ways. Uh, officially I met the owner and founder of Tomato Joss in a competition held in Lagos, um, FMN Prize for Innovation. That's where we actually met uh, formally and they have been helping us because Tomato Jaws, we can go to them at any time. They have given us that room to actually go to them at any time, uh, discuss about our challenges, um, what do we need, uh, was seed because we've been getting a lot of improved seed from tomato juice uh, and that has helped the yield of our farmers uh, because they can go to um, do their research get a good seed that would actually thrive um, and then inform us there's a seed and then we can actually buy for our farmers and then we sell to, do, to our farmers um, tomato juice has uh, as I don't know what the word, the, the right words to use, I can only call them as mentors because um, there are a lot of, you know, starting, starting a business, especially in this part of the country, is not actually um, as easy as, uh, as, as it looks like because there are so many challenges that comes with business. But one good thing that I, I, I know and I believe is when you have a mentor that is already into those into that space that is ready to assist you that's ready to um give you the needed information that you need uh i believe you you try um because tomato jaws uh aside from aside that they're, they're the only indigenous um company in nigeria right now that are doing really great working with smallholder farmers um trying to see how they also increase the income of farmers. Uh, so we're trying to replicate more what they are doing around our own, uh, because they have already shown us, okay, there's a way we can actually increase the income of these farmers. And that is actually what we are trying to also do in our locations where we operate. Because one, one of the, one of the um, major enemy to every every um, founder that comes into the tomato paste, uh, tomato space is to see that they have added their own quarter, contributed their quarter to see how they can bring an end to post-harvest losses. Because that's the, that's, that, that's the big enemy. And that is actually what we are on our own path in Palmac. That's what we are actually looking at. That's actually what we are working on. To see that at the end of the day, uh, there's no reason why we will lose 700 metric tons annually to post harvest losses. So um, we are trying to see how we can contribute our own quarter to see that these farmers don't experience such uh, challenge in the nearest future.
I saw an interview with her a few years ago and she mentioned some of the other opportunities in the tomato value chain. She mentioned stuff like um, um, tractor maintenance. Um, she mentioned stuff like sun-dried tomatoes. Um, you know, I don't think she mentioned stuff like ketchup, but um, speaking to you in terms of your company, um, do you see yourself expanding beyond uh, the agric services and the tomato powder? Do you see yourself creating other products from tomatoes or are you kind of just sticking to the tomato powder for now? Okay. Um, I, I think by the end of the year, we'll be introducing um, some other products um, that falls for tomato, we are all, we are we are just working on tomato for now, and then try to see how we blend with pepper and onions. But we will see the likes of uh, having palmac pepper, palmac onion flakes or powder, and then ginger powder. By the end of the year, we'll be we'll be seeing something like this in the market. We it's something that we are working on. Um, because not only uh, tomato, we only know of tomato post harvest losses. But when you when you look at pepper, when you look at onions, these are these are things that are seasonal, and we experience scarcity in the market. Um, so what we produce, uh, I I I often talk about that is 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 important for us to bring the innovations, the technology in the agri space. But I think our innovations and what we are trying to do in the agri space, if we cannot keep what we produce, I think that's where the that's will that, that should be our major focus. What we are producing currently, how do we preserve these things? How do we keep them? This is something that um, we don't actually we are not actually doing. Most of the entrepreneurs that comes into the agri space, they talk about okay, the AI introducing AI into agri space, introducing the latest innovations, but storage. Nobody talk about storage. Nobody talk about uh, this post harvest that we are experiencing, like year in year out. It will shock you to 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 to, to know that we lost sixty percent of what we produce as a country. In Africa, we lose around 50 to, to 60 percent of the entire uh, commodities that we produce. So we are working we are, at the, before the end of the year, we are working to see how um, not only in tomato, but other uh, vegetables, other perishables, um, where we, 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 have, we have actually had mango powder, uh, mango flax. Um, we are working on pineapple, flax. All these are commodities that actually, when it's during the season, a lot goes to post harvest losses. A lot got rotten because uh, they are seasonal. And when they are being produced in, in large quantity, what are, there is nobody, nobody is actually doing anything about preserving these things. So most of it got spoiled. So we're trying to see how we can increase the shelf life of all these commodities and then introduce it to the market so that we will not be experiencing seasonality and scarcity in the market. I completely 100% agree with you. And especially when you talk about stuff like AI, blockchain, all these kind of fancy technologies, sometimes you have to go back to basics um, and actually try and, you know, like you say, reduce the amount of post-harvest losses. So uh, with that being said, speaking uh, still on the subject of reducing the post-harvest losses, right? Um, the cold chain. Um, again, I'm not a tomato farmer. I don't know enough about the value chain, but um, is there an opportunity for people with um, refrigerated trucks or um, cold rooms or um, those kind of things? Or do you think that is more suited to other fruits and vegetables that have a longer kind of shelf life because you said it's last like six seven days right so what do you think about cold chain for the tomato value chain yeah i i love i love what samson obole is doing um with swellers farm lab in um Ogun. because aside from his swells farm lab what he's doing is he he, he provide those cold chain tractors uh trucks 
that move around uh, in Lagos to because his farm is in Ogun, and when he harvests them, he sells them mostly in uh, in Lagos. So I love what he's doing. I think if we can have more of that, um, those that those cold uh, tin tractor uh, trucks. I don't know how the chef life. I don't know. I don't know much information about them, but I I believe it preserved those tomatoes, those pepper for some time before um, it get it, it gets spoiled, and then you can be able to. Uh, I believe it should be it should be up to a month if they are inside those uh, cold trucks. So if people more people can can actually come in uh, with those with the cold chain system of storage uh let me say in the north we don't actually have that uh, you're transporting tomato from gumbi to lagos if there's a delay if a truck had a problem before it got to lagos you'll find out that some percentage of the tomato have spoiled and you can't actually sell it but if we're using those kind of trucks you you you, you make your delivery successfully you can actually come to the north. Um, you know, tomato is still seasonal in Nigeria, in as much as how we uh, classify it. But tomato is still a seasonal product produced in Nigeria because there are no tomato farmers. I always say this: there are no tomato farmers in Nigeria. We only have farmers who, at the end of their farming season, from September, when they harvest their corn. Or when they have raised their rice, they find okay. Why don't I plant tomato and get extra source of income? So they plant from that September, October, November. By December, they started harvesting. So by the time they decide not to farm this uh, tomato, we we'll have no tomato in the country. There are not like this certain people. What they do is they farm tomato. We don't actually have. Uh, there are only few. Even if we have, so when the, when these uh, people farmers farm this tomato, and then there are these cold trucks around, they uptake from them and then take it to locations where these tomato are not readily available. You know, it will give them that uh, ginger to farm more. It will give them that okay, we have uptakers. If we farm our produce, none is going to waste. When we harvest, there are people that actually buy it. So um, I think there's a very huge opportunity around people who actually wants to go into storage, like the cold room storage, um, the cold uh, trucks, if, you, if it will be available to farmers. Because one thing with a the, with the farmer is he wants assurance. When you talk with a farmer, he wants, okay, he can actually do anything. But he can actually farm anything. But will he be able to what he what he invested? Will he be able to get it in return? If he's sure of okay, if I farm my produce and these people are going to buy it, he will definitely go ahead and do more. Where we operate right now, we have more people who have abandoned farming for a very long time that are coming back because they know that these farmers, when they farm these that um, produces, there are people who actually who actually buy it. So I have been farming tomato but because when I farm them, I don't get any off ticker. Nobody comes to buy. I have to go to one farm or uh, one city, transport it to another location to actually sell it. And I've been having challenges. I'll, I can actually say, okay, there's no need for me to even farm this thing again. But when, I, when I'm sure, okay, these people will actually buy it you see that these farmers will increase their hectare. We'll see, okay, more, many more people. You know, our location is a, um, we have many more people who actually are victims of um, insurgents. We have many people who are actually, uh, they are displaced people around this location. So they're actually looking for something to do. Some of them are, 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 are maybe they have their villages, they have their they have where they are living, but because of insurgency, they have left their place and they are looking for opportunities. So this, most of these people 
we actually get them together, talk to them. We may not have much to offer, but if you can farm this commodity, we can actually buy it. And when they engage in farming this commodity and then they find out that, okay, these guys are actually buying it. You see, next year, some other people will have, um, will say, okay, let me come in also. Next year, you see many more people coming in. Coming in. So when, this, when these people, let's say the entire village now are now farming this commodity, and then there are people who actually want to venture into um, the value chain, I think cold, cold room, uh, cold trucks will be very, very important in the tomato industry. Because even the people that are processing in, um, let's say, in the West, if there are these cold trucks around, they will be very happy to meet up with uh, people's demand. Many, many of these factories are not actually meeting up with the capacity. They're not meeting up with their, like, their own capacity. You see that a uh, tomato factory will be set up for 30 tons capacity per day. But you find out that before the, the year will finish, like it will run 365 days, but it will not even reach that capacity of a daily production because there is no raw material. So I, I actually strongly believe for people who actually want to go into cold, cold chain, cold room storage, they will actually uh, make a lot out of it. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, you know, you, you, you touched on the subject that I was going to kind of round up on, which is the major challenges. And you mentioned the insecurity and insurgency. So um, what what are the other kind of, are there, are there any other kind of challenges that you're facing in the tomato value chain, um, be it security, be it other things? Uh, can you touch on any things that are kind of obstacles to growing this industry? Okay, for um, I think every manufacturer right now in the country is actually facing the issue of um, instability of dollar. Um, I think there is no manufacturer that is no actually facing that difficulty. Uh, because as a country, we, we still don't produce our packaging materials. Uh, we still import packaging materials. And when the current, when dollar is not stable, today is this price, tomorrow is another price, uh, you would like to sell at a price where you bought your raw material, your packaging materials. Um, you find out that, okay, like our product is powdered tomato, locally sourced uh, raw materials, but yeah, it's being sold as a, at a price that you will be like, okay, this is locally sourced, but what is being used to package it is actually imported. So you, 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 the, the price that we as a company want to sell it, we might not be able to even sell it because the reason why we are sourcing from locally, uh, locally, local farmers, smallholder farmers, is for them to be able to buy our products. The farmer that we are buying from, they should be able to buy our own product. Um, if they cannot buy a subset of our products, I think the aim uh, has been jeopardized. We want an average Nigerian to be able to buy what we are selling because it's locally sourced in Nigeria from smallholder farmers. So one of the challenges is inst this instability of uh, dollar price and uh, the devaluation of Naira that occurred last year, I think has also affected uh, so many manufacturers. I have many, many people who have actually closed down their factories because of uh, this particular issue. Um, so this has been a challenge. But you know, they said as, a, as an entrepreneur, you're there to find solutions to every of the challenges that is coming your way. Um, and other challenges is the region where we operate. They were, we operate in Northeast. You know, Northeast is being tagged as an insurgent region, um, but things are changing. Um, we have had so many challenges with even doing business because when you're when you're from the when you're from a region where there's too much insurgence that has operated 
you actually face a problem um, because nobody wants to do business with uh, or oh, like say he wants to come and invest in a region where he's been faced with insurgency. Um, but we have been uh, resilient. We have been trying to see how, uh, what that, that stigma is not affecting us. Because one of the things uh, investors actually want is to see how you attract them. Going to them sometimes, you may not really get what you're looking for. But if you can attract them by what you're doing, I think uh, that's why we sell most of our commodities or most of our products, not in this region. We try as much as possible to shift our product. I think our highest selling uh, zone is the Southwest zone. That's where we sell most of our commodities. So uh, with, 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 with these challenges, it has not actually uh, affected our operations. We this these are challenges that are that are, that, that, that are dear. Um, recently, there's a increase in fuel prices, which has affected so many business as well. You see, fact is closing down every day because if you can't actually the cost of operation is more than the income, you have to close down. Uh, so. But beyond that, we are we are we 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 are we are doing anything possible to see that we are in business uh, because these are challenges that many other people have faced. It. That's why you need mentors in business, um, mentors who have actually passed through these routes to be able to put you through. Uh, because if these are if these challenges are the are the reason why you're closing down or you're shutting down, you're going out of business then some people who have actually passed through this stage will tell you that you're not ready for business that's why we are actually we're actually happy to have people um in flour mill nigeria uh, uh tomato jars and we have many people who are like in the top industries in nigeria who actually are mentors okay this is the problem what have you faced a, a this similar problem? Yeah, they will tell you they have faced something that is more than this, but and they have stayed in business. So, uh, in as much as there are challenges, I believe you still have your way around those challenges. And one of the best way to have your way around those challenges is to have a mentor who is actually in a sector where you operate, who have actually passed through what you're what you're passing through. So, if this if if your mentor have passed through what you've passed through. Uh, I think you're on a safe side because he will be able to tell you what he's done. Um, many people, one of the challenges, I don't really want mentioning funding as a challenge because uh, I was privileged to meet so many people who started business into the manufacturing space uh, that has no funding for their businesses. And today they are global. So what did they, what did they do? They were able to share what they did. Okay, without the funding, what did they actually do? One plus one, they were able to meet these people, they were able to do that. And then you find out that you implement the part, that same um, solutions and then it will work for you because it's, it's a similar scenario. Um, so I think uh, that's all I can say about the challenges. Thank you so much. It's uh, very in-depth. Um, you've given us a lot to think about. You've spoken about the challenges. You speak about mentorship, collaborations, opportunities, um, different, you know, um, value chains, etc. So your this this conversation has been very, very, very interesting and and helpful. So I guess the last question I would ask is, you know, um, first of all, please share your your social media. How can people reach out to you? if they want to collaborate and then also let us know if there's any kind of partnerships you're looking for um, from an anywhere like farmers, packaging, anything. Um, tell us, you know, what kind of partnerships you're looking for. Uh, okay. Um, currently we are looking for, uh, in terms of partnership, we are looking at how we can be able to plant more doom solar dryers in Nigeria. Um, I believe our work would be much more easier if we have much more doom solar dryers. 
um, where these farmers are perishable. So it's called upon in Kebi, where there are a lot of perishables that nobody is doing anything about it. And I am trying to see how we can actually partner with um, not, uh, some NGOs, uh, some individuals to see how we can plant doom solar dryers in their location. Uh, because if we can have as much, uh, one of the, I was able to um, approach Raw Material Development Council, which I actually share with them how, what, what, what can they do for the farmers? Um, the proposal is, is, is all about planting doom solar dryers so that farmers can benefit from it. You know, sometimes one of the, uh, we may not, like government, government may not really okay, want to support an individual, a company or something, but these are things that you do for the farmers. And these farmers actually need, maybe that are, it, it, can, be, it can be a project, okay, a constituency project, um, it can be a, a, a donation for like, okay, I want to support farmers. How do I support these farmers? I plant this doom solar dryer. So our, I am, I'm in discussion with many, and I think these are the areas um, of partnership that we're looking at um, to see how we can set up doom solar dryers in so many locations. Because if we can be able to set up those doom solar dryers, we will have, as a company, we will have raw materials all, all year round. And our target market is not actually in Nigeria. Uh, we have sent our products to Niger, Cameroon, Ghana, and the demand is, uh, one of our challenges that I was not able to mention is meeting up with demand. We have more people who are demanding our products and that we are not meeting up with their demand. So with many more doom solar dryers, in the country, we will definitely meet their demand and then penetrate into the market that we so desire, that's Europe. Because we have had order from UK, um, we have sent samples, and then they are requesting for something, uh, you know, in tons. Uh, so we're trying to see how we scale up production, how we can be able to uh, meet up with, those, with this market. Um, you know, Nigeria is just a, a number market. Uh, it's just a number market because you can only you can you can you can just break even in Nigeria. But if you are looking at profit, you need to export. So we are trying to see how we can uh, do more partnership with government, with individuals, to see how we can set up more doom solar dryers. And when it comes to um, partnership, yeah, we are looking for other partnership. Like let, let's say. Um, but packaging, yeah, we really want to change our packaging um, because we have we, we what we are using currently the chef life is just for 12, 14 months. That's the chef life. But what we are looking at, we're looking at, at but the research that we have done, the powder can actually stay for six years. So we just our packaging is just um, let me say quarter of. It's not even up to cut out of our expectation. So we needed that packaging that can actually last for a very long period of time so that we can be able to do export comf uh, comfortably. Um, so uh, I think our social media handles are on IG is Palmax Syndicate underscore. Uh, Facebook is Palmax Syndicate. And uh, on... Uh, on X, Twitter, uh, is Palmax Syndicate 643. Fantastic, fantastic. And one very quick question. How much is this Doom Solar Dryer? How much is one of them, approximately? Okay, uh, the Doom Solar Dryer, I think it has their various capacities. Um, we have, what we're looking at, like in a state, Oh, let's see. Um, yeah, in a state, we should be able to have like five tones because that's the proposal we sent. We have we have sent to uh, Acumen. We have contact with Acumen recently, and then one of the things they they actually requested what what, what we requested from them is uh, a drying plant. 
and which is like one uh, five tons capacity per badge. So, and that doom, uh, th that drying plant is around 126 million, uh, but we can have smaller, let's say one ton capacity, like in locations, in strategic locations where these farmers are, you can even have less than uh, one ton capacity. Depending on the uh, on the location, depending on um, the, the number of farmers that are in that location, but uh, one of like in a state, what we are requesting, let's say in a state, let's say a kind of general doom solar dryer, is around five tons, and uh, it's a plant. It will be a drying plant on its own. Uh, the housing, the plant is there, and it's solar actually where farmers can just uh, come in with their perishables and dry. Uh, and then, like for someone who actually wants to set up that particular plant, we can, the person can like, okay, an individual can actually decide to set up that plant. And then um, over the years, when farmers come to dry, they pay commission. So if, even if it's government, because that one, of the, one of the proposals we have, we have given individuals and government is, if you want to set up such drying plants, one of the things that we can do for you is to maintain it. And then when farmers are being charged, a certain percentage, um, that, that money goes to you, goes to the individual or goes to the government, depending on uh, how an individual or government or NGO wants to, do, wants to um, come in and partner in building a drying plant. Fantastic, fantastic, Musa. Um, it's been a fantastic and amazing conversation. I really thank you for joining me today and sharing your uh, knowledge on the Tomato Valley chain and, and much more, actually. So um, I really, really, really wish you the best in your business. Um, and I re wish that, you know, this conversation can reach the right people and you can find the investment and partnerships that come from it. So ha have a very lovely day and um, we'll definitely keep in touch soon. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Okay. Bye. This podcast is sponsored by Kadan Kadan.